What's going on guys? It's Evil Eddie from Pure Evil MMA, ProWrestlingAuthority.com. I got a great show set up for everybody today for episode number 23. Thanks for tuning in to Pro Wrestling Authority Podcasting Network. I got an amazing, amazing show for everybody. Valor Fight 38 fighters come on, and this weekend it is officially Fight Week again. Later in the show, we're going to be talking about RDA versus Tony Ferguson. I got the weekly news set up for everybody, and Minion has one hell of a warm-up for this weekend's fights. Follow us on Twitter. Make sure you guys give us a follow on Twitter at Evil Under Echo and at Pure Evil MMA. Give us a like on Facebook. Five stars down below. Share this podcast with all your MMA friends and family. We do this every week. I got some good news. I got some bad news today. The bad news, uh, more like an open door, but you're going to have to wait and see. Let's get right into our weekly news. It was a crazy week between Showtime Pettis' house being set ablaze and a bunch more. Bellator fights, we got a new champion. Liam McGeary has finally lost his belt tonight. I was supposed to be there at Bellator tonight, but fell through on me. And I was not too happy about it. But shout out to Bloody Elbows, Eddie Mercado, who was ringside tonight. Shout out to Nutmeg MMA. And all my MMA brothers and sisters that were there uh, watching tonight's amazing event. Liam McGeary, though, undefeated up until tonight. A lot of people wanted to know what he could do in there against uh, Mr. Wonderful Phil Davis. If he could have beaten Phil Davis here, it would have cemented him as a true champion in the eyes of UFC fans. He just beat Tito Ortiz. Submitted Tito Ortiz, not to mention. Only the third person ever, I'm pretty sure ever submit Tito Ortiz so you know pat on the back to him there but five rounds he spent on his back and every single round I was like you know what do not count or sleep on Liam McGeary because we've seen him submit people off of his back however round after round Phil Davis overpowering him playing in that wrestling game and cements himself as the new champion tonight so congratulations to him I got an amazing guest lined up tonight and uh, Valor Fight 38 and then guys Titan FC if you guys don't already have Fight Pass, you're missing out. All you got to pay is like 9 bucks, 8 bucks a month or something like that. You got Cage Titans. You got everything. Every single fight. You got Fightography. You got all the recent pay-per-views that came out. Absolutely amazing thing. And Valor Fight 38 is going to be going down. I got to speak with a couple of them. Let's jump right into our week. Ronda came out on Ellen DeGeneres. We remember last time that she was on there. She broke out saying that she was uh, you know, suicidal. And we've seen this happen with a lot of fighters before in the past. Saying that you know they, they're upset. Maybe they're not suicidal to the point where uh, people who have lost people to suicide think they are. I mean, that's a heavy word to be throwing around to people saying that they're suicidal. So, of course, my eyebrow raised and what is going on here? She's not handling this the right way. But she came back on Ellen DeGeneres again this week. And uh, here's what she had to say. She had to say that this is going to be one of her last fights. Not her last fight, guys. Keyword here is one of her last fights. She has to fight Holly Holm. I mean, am I the only one that thinks that after this fight against Amanda, and this is going to be an amazing fight, guys, but after this, I really think that she's going to win this. She has to fight Holly Holm. And even if she Ronda loses here, she still has to fight Holly Holm. Holly Holm's on a two-fight losing streak. She just lost to... Uh, Valentina Shevchenko, so it's it's a it's a tough fight for Ronda here, but honestly, I think that her uh, her game is still alive. That that night that she fought Holly Holm was just an off night for her, and Amanda's fought uh, Misha Tate, who also seemed like it was an off night for Misha Tate that night. So this is probably the lineup for Ronda in her last fight. It's, it's got to be you get Amanda in there, you get Holly, and then everyone is going to push for that cyborg fight. Everyone's going to think, all right. This has got to be Ronda's last fight, right? There's no way you can go out of the game without that. It's going to be hanging over your shoulder the rest of your life. Now, it's the question of, is she going to go up to 145? And that's the point where I argue. That's the point where I push back a little bit here. I think if Cyborg wants to fight Ronda Rousey, she should have to drop down to Ronda Rousey's weight class to beat her at her champion weight class. But then again, we rewind back to uh, before Ronda was in the UFC, she did say that she was planning on, after she beat Misha, moving up and taking on Cyborg. But here's what Ronda had to say this week on Ellen DeGeneres. Check it out, guys. Like, beaming and, 
and healthy and happy and yeah, all that. I feel good. I yeah. feel good. Yeah. Yeah, because you're like two months away from, from a fight, and so you must be in like top condition right now. Yeah, I've been doing, I've trained twice a day since the beginning of August, so... Yeah, I finally feel like in super ninja good mode. Because it's been, because uh, <laughs> it's been uh, uh, over a year, right? About a year since you fought last. Yeah. So when you when you train, do you not only fight, but what other workouts do you do to train? What other workouts do I do? Do you do like like lots of jump rope and lots of cardio and stuff like that? I do a lot of like running, jumping, climbing trees, anything like different to make it like you know interesting every day. Not do you like, climb oh, trees, really? I can climb a tree. I can climb the hell out of a tree. Wow. Yeah. Do you just like see a tree and, and say I'm going to climb that tree? I mean, you got to wait for like a good one. Like an African coral tree is really like oh, my favorite, you yeah. know, but you never know. You a know? good coral tree. But those, those <laughs> limbs, they'll, they'll snap on you pretty quick because they do. Just coral trees. What are you trying to say? I'm, I'm just saying they snap. <laughs> just be careful. I don't want you to get hurt. All right. So, so it's December 30th, right? That's yeah. the fight? So that's kind of like the holidays. That ruins like Christmas and everything for you, doesn't it? I mean, it just postpones it. I mean, my, my nieces love it because they think they get double the Christmas because we call it second Christmas. We have it afterward. Right. And they think they get twice the presents, not the same presents split in half. So. Right. So now you're going to fight this fight, and you will win, I assume. Um, and then w w how much longer will you keep fighting? Because it's, you know, it's a dangerous business. Not that long. I'm wrapping it up. This is definitely one of my last fights. So. One of your last fights. Yeah. You better, everyone better watch. Cause yeah. The show is going to be around forever. Well, especially if you're saying that. We are gonna, I mean, we were going to watch anyway. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, because I would think, because I, I know there's a lot of other things you can do and want to do. And, you know, and I understand you wanting to go back in the ring and, and fight and, you know, be the champion, and which you will. There you go, guys. It's going to be one of her last fights. I mean, she was obviously planning on saying that to everybody. That's not something that she just muttered under her breath. I mean, that was an announcement that she, that's been on her mind. And this is the thing. I hate hearing when fighters say that. It almost shows a sign of weakness. You guys agree with me? Make sure you guys let me know on Twitter at Pure Evil MMA and let me know because we saw this happen with DC right before he was about to fight John Bones. However, the fight never went down, but still, it's a sign of weakness. And going in there fighting Amanda, if you lose, it's just going to be that much of a heavier burden on your back. Ronda has to go in there. She has to get this win. I do see her coming out the other side of this. If it is one of her last fights, she's had an amazing career and has opened up doors for so many female fighters out there. So whether you love her, whether you hate her, you got to give love to Ronda Rousey for opening our eyes and opening Dana White's eyes. Dana White said a couple years ago, and quote for quote, saying that women would never fight in the UFC. And what do we got now? Every time there's a female fighter on the card, it's one of the best fights of the night. And not to mention, UFC 200, our main event. Come on, UFC 200, one of the biggest landmarks in UFC history. Main event was a female fight. So come on, women have come a long way, and you can thank Ronda Rousey and Misha Tate for that. I mean, Misha Tate was at the top of that card, so people not giving her the respect, but Misha Tate, one of the front runners for female fighters as well. Looking to see what she can do next. But guys, this is going to be one of la Ronda's last fights. Who do you want to see her fight? My lineup is Amanda, Holly, and Cyborg. A lot of fight female fighters out there are going to be pretty pissed if those are the only three fighters. I'm not happy that it might be the last of uh, we see of Ronda Rousey. After going in there, making all these fights in under 30 seconds, she had a lot of uh, expectation on her back. And that was the issue the night of uh, the Holly home fight. Everyone was expecting her to beat every opponent that we placed in front of her in 30 seconds or less. If you dragged Ronda out past the first round, we all called that uncharted water. You can't say that about any other fighter in the UFC. Not even Conor McGregor. No one. Only Ronda Rousey now has the talent level raised since that time. Amanda was, of course, on that season of Ultimate Fighter. And Ronda was one of the coaches. Meech was one of the coaches. And we've seen a lot of fighters come out of that season and the recurrent season as well with Joanna. And uh, it's one hell of a ride for female MMA fighters. Let's give Ronda a pat on the back. All right, Luke Rockhold out of his fight with Jacare Souza. Now what? Now what do you do? And I saw this funny meme this week uh, of everyone knows Luke Rockhold's uh, girlfriend. I'm not going to say her name on here, but the meme said, hey, you're not the only one that's mad when Luke Rockhold pulls out. I thought that would deserve Tweet of the Week. So congratulations, whoever did that. You get Tweet of the Week. But yeah, guys, I do not think Jacare is going to risk himself fighting a lower opponent like uh, Rob Whitaker, uh, 
like Whitaker. I just don't see it. I mean, people are saying, what about Silva? Shout out to MMA advocates uh, throwing that out there. What about Anderson Silva? If we throw Silva back in this four-man tournament, it's still – I'm still excited for it. I mean, this is what the UFC has set. This is what Dana White and everyone has set for this. It's a four-man tournament for the belt. You got Bisbing, who's had one hell of a year so far after he's beaten, uh, you know, Silva, beaten Rockhold, and now beaten Dan Henderson. You got him up there holding the title. You got Chris Weidman fighting at UFC 205 against Joel Romero. No injuries there yet. Cross our fingers when I say that and knock on wood. But you got Chris Weidman, you all, and then you got Jacare waiting for an opponent. Now, if we put... Silva in there, does it check out with all of you guys? Checks out with me over here at Pure Evil MMA. I would love that. We're going to be waiting to find out, and hopefully next week's podcast we can make an announcement. There's not a man alive that can come on this soil and so be Conor me. McGregor's conference call with Eddie Alvarez. He was throwing around some big words at, against Eddie, saying that uh, Eddie's children are going to be begging him not to go back into the fight. Daddy, daddy, please don't go back into fight. Saying that. Eddie Alvarez just isn't going to be the same. Conor McGregor said, "Look at Ed, look at uh, look at Jose Aldo, look look at him after he fought me, 13 seconds, and he's never been the same." Eddie uh, replies, "Well, let's get it right. It's not 13, it's 13, and it's just like that schoolyard playground uh, shout outs again. School, uh, schoolyard bullies, bully talk right there. Eddie Alvarez with a fourth grade comeback." <laughs> And guys, we got some birthday shout outs this week as well. We always like to give our uh, MMA legends out there, MMA fighters, a uh, birthday shout out over here from Pure Evil MMA. Cub Swanson, who's got an upcoming fight, he's turning 33 November 2nd, which is actually, uh, it's already passed. <laughs> so happy birthday to Cub Swanson. November 5th, the Barn Cat turned 30. Amir Khan turned 22 as well. November 6th, Damian Maya turning 39. November 10th birthday. Josh Barnett turning 39 as well. And November 12th, Jorge Masvidal turning 32. Damien Maya, though, still one of the top-ranked fighters and turning 39 this week, man. No one still can figure this man out. He's had one hell of a year so far, beating Matt Brown. And then his last fight, beating Carlos Condit. No one can do anything. We, only, we saw that same technique tonight uh, to an extent. I mean, Damien Maya doesn't go uh, all five rounds here. First round, he finishes him. But we saw the same thing tonight with Phil Davis. Phil Davis, round after round against Liam McGeary, taking that belt. No one can figure him out. All right, guys. Like I said in the intro, Showtime Pettis, cars lit ablaze. And I was talking about this with Ted Check. I mean, when Mischief Night would roll around in my neighborhood, we'd go out, we'd egg houses, we'd play Ding Dong Ditch. Never, ever have we lit houses or barns or... Anything, cars, never let any of that on fire. So this this has gotten a little crazy now. Whether it was a, mis a mischief night mayhem or just uh, some stunad out there being a, an idiot. I mean, right in Showtime Pettis' driveway. I posted these photos up on my Twitter. They're all over Twitter right now. Go check out Showtime Pettis' Twitter. Right in his driveway, Little Blaze, he responded on Instagram with, uh, with a few words and... That's up on his Instagram. You can check that out. I talked about it this week on Evil and Intoxicated. Me and Ted Check go live every Wednesday night on YouTube at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Make sure you check that out. One of the biggest shows uh, building on MMA. And this actually gets me to uh, some of my sad news, guys. Let me uh, try to break it in, mend it in with this uh, with this story of Showtime to uh, cap off our bad news. Uh, Pro Wrestling Authority is going to be shutting its doors in the next couple of weeks. One of the reasons why this podcast came out a little late I was trying to figure out uh, figure out what I was going to do. I mean, I talked with a couple places, Front Proof Media being one of them. But Pro Wrestling Authority shutting its doors has nothing to do with any of the people that work for Pro Wrestling Authority. Uh, our boss, Max, you know, he's a young guy, 22 years old. He's uh, moving on now. He opened this website. Really all he wanted was people to have fun, write, write articles, enjoy WWF, WWE. I came along. He picked me up, helped me get my start here. Uh... You know, if it wasn't for Max, guys, I wouldn't even be broadcasting over the airwaves right now into your car, into your earphones right now. So we all got to thank Pro Wrestling Authority for helping me get a, a pure evil MMA situated, grounded with my feet on the ground. I know what direction I'm heading into now. Max really helped me building my game uh, through broadcasting school. He was right next to me helping me. I learned just as much as I learned from Max that I did at school. So uh, I'm excited to announce the next step. And... Uh, you know, we're not going to lose anything. I'm going to be talking with Max. We're not going to lose any of our subscribers. 
We're not going to be losing this page right here. So do, so don't you worry. Don't you worry, guys. I am not going anywhere. But I wanted to make sure I got that in there. Pure Evil MMA isn't going anywhere, guys. So don't you worry. But Pro Wrestling Authority is shutting its doors. And Pure Evil MMA will be taking its next steps onto this journey. And it's been one hell of a journey. I mean, our next episode will be doing a, a best of. So we got that to look forward to. So, uh, yeah, that's our bad news of the week. Last thing I want to touch on some good news and uh you know doomsday i got to speak with doomsday last time i was at a a press meet and this is what he had to say i mean he was aut he's an autistic man and we didn't know this earlier in his career he didn't even really know what was uh, going on he had trouble in school it was labeled as a you know very touchy subject with the word retard and 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 when people you know utter out idiotic things like that at this day and age 2016 when you say the word retard it's just not right. It's not socially right to say those things. They talked about this week on Fighter and the Kid. And Doomsday Howard, I mean, brought the subject up. And I wanted to share this with you guys. You guys can find this full interview up on my YouTube page at Pure Evil MMA. Make sure you check it out. But here's a little clip from what Doomsday Howard had to say about him having to deal with him being autistic. And you know what? I got some a little cousin in my family who's autistic. And his little brother has uh, Tourette Syndrome. So... Here's what Doomsday Howard had to say. Check it out. You can find the full interview up on Pure Evil MMA. Up on Pure Evil MMA. Personal uh, recent article released about you. Uh, yes. I didn't want to. Well, hopefully you don't mind me mentioning oh, it now. Let's do it. Let's do um, it. You know, how, how, how long has it been since you've known your diagnosis? And, and how has that affected your, your fighting since you since you've... Because it's a recent discovery, uh, or I don't want to say label, but a recent diagnosis. Is, yeah. is that, uh, how has, when did that come about, and how did that affect this training camp, or previous? Right, well, let me let me answer that question the best honestly again. I always knew there was something about me. I was slow, you want to see, I don't want to see retardations, I don't like using that word. But, or, because my whole life I was a special in classes, what happened is, because the schools I went to, I went to public schools, we, they didn't have the resources to find out what, what's the technical words with me. Because I didn't follow the standard of their standards, we don't meet the standards, it just puts you in special education. So my whole life, I knew something was up. I know, I know it wasn't necessarily, you know, retarded or stupid or anything. I, like, again, I hate using that word because I got teased like that, but I knew something was up. So my whole life, I knew something. What it is, is that through my mother, through heart training and through counseling, you know, like, I can't tell I have, I have a speech impediment. You know, it took it took years, I mean, years and years and years, just for me to have a speech impediment. And, and certain words, I still can't pronounce, but it's it's good enough where I can communicate with y'all. And communication with the average human being was hard. So we, oh, we always knew there was something wrong with me. We just didn't know, know what. Well, we I saw a neurologist, I had a talk with them, they said I should get tested, I got tested and come to find out I'm clinically autistic. You know, and that's the, my diagnosis. And people like they they're saying, Oh, that um, they're proud of me and everything and I'm saying thank you all and they try to treat me some certain way. And I'm telling everybody, listen, my disability or disadvantage, if you want to call this it's not a disadvantage for me. I dealt with this all my whole life, being teached from schools and stuff like that, from teachers, being so I dealt with it. But in my head I beat it. I mean, look what I'm doing. I'm on NBC Sports, World Series, I'm in the UFC, I did all kinds of stuff since that story. Okay? And I don't use my disability as an excuse. I say my disability is my advantage. Because if I could beat that, what's gonna stop me? What's gonna stop me? Right right now, like you understand being an autistic child and not know what it is, it is it is difficult to learn how to speak in front of people and do this. This took years to learn. You don't understand, this took mad years to learn. Like I have to really just come in here, I have to think. 10 five steps of his just in case like any questions i have i'm already prepared for it so that's the way i have to train i've trained myself but because i have that in me already i beat i beat my diagnosis all right so when they told me i was like oh okay yeah that's no big deal this guys know that way i have but i don't care because i beat it so like but the, another main reason i did it i didn't do it for publicity i didn't do it for i did it for kids yeah. okay i came up seeing these kids with special needs being bullied from not only from from students from teachers some of these teachers are mean, especially in Boston Public Schools, all they're mean. They, they, they hit these kids and everything, and no one believed the special need kids because they're special need. Mm -hmm. So I think it's my responsibility to let them know, listen, I come from the same class as you come from, and I made it. Okay, so if I can make it, you can. And now kids have the inspiration, like, wow, he's just like me, 
If he could do it, I could do it too. I'm doing more for the kids. I give a care if it gets me media. I, I don't care. It's more for the kids because I know what those kids suffer through. I know how it is growing up with those disabilities. And now I could be a spokesperson. Listen, you see me as a great person, okay? I have the same disability you did and I did it. So for the next person, the next kids are growing up, now they have something to look for. And now the disabilities, I can tell, listen, it's just a minor setback. But once you get over your hump, that's it. Okay, being autistic, I can't learn as, as fast as y'all. It might take the average person three times. It takes me 100, 200, 300. But the difference is, once I learn it, that's it. I don't forget it. That's the advantage. Once I learn something, that's it. So we clearly heard your message for the kids, but if you could send a message to the administrators and the teachers, what would your message be to them for the children that they might not be able to identify like yourself? Be patient, okay? We know it's your job, we know your job sucks, but be patient. Because the kids have a uh, disability doesn't mean because your education tells you one thing. If you just sit and talk to each other and study the child one-on-one, -on -one, you'll learn something. Now, not all special education is bad, you know what I'm saying? I say thank you to some of the special education because some of the special education helped me to perceive where I am. You know, not all the teachers are bad. I'm not saying, I'm not attacking all teachers. When I meet a special teacher, I say thank you because a lot of teachers do care and take the next level, and because of them, I can speak better, I can talk to you, I can do this, I can look in your face around. You know, years ago, you know how I was to look into someone's face and talk to them? That was, that was hard. You know what I'm and still I still do, I look in your face, I look to the side of everything, but I can remind myself to look back. So it's a lot of stuff I did with my diagnosis, but I, I learned to do it. But that's from special education. Now, half of it is good, half of it is bad. But my message to them is, take your time and learn. One on one, it takes one hour a day, one on what's going on, why can you do this? You break it down, don't give them an equation, you break it all the way down to one plus one. Then you just actually go from there. Anytime I have a hard equation, I break it down to that simple one plus one, and I go from there. And that's why I am what I am today. There you go, guys. Doomsday Howard fighting for World Series of Fighting now. And we never knew this. I mean, it's just, this is pretty recent. This is from this year where he got diagnosed. And that was a very important message and for somebody that has family with uh you know this disease and honestly my little cousin who has uh, Tourette syndrome and uh my little cousin who has autism my little cousin who has autism is one of the best guitarists i know and he's i think he's 18 now and i've been playing guitar my whole life i've been in a band since i was 14 years old lead singer picked up the guitar this kid literally if you look at his fingers when he plays guitar you'll get a headache that's how sick he is at playing and You've seen this a lot in the past uh, 20 years that there's been more education on this. And for a fighter to have been diagnosed with autism at this stage in his career where he's been one of the top guys in MMA, very important that he spreads that message with you. And that is why I wanted to share it with all of you tonight. And lastly, guys, to end out our weekly news, we got a new baby rat. You guys got to name the last one. You named it after Frankie Edgar. Well, this time we got a little baby one. I'll be posting the pictures up on my Twitter. Make sure you follow us at Pure Evil on the May. And I'm going to let all of our listeners name it. And uh, it's up to you. So make sure you let me know what you guys want to name it. Angie Jab was kind of thinking of uh, a Greek name. Thinking of uh, like fairy tale names. I said, I'm pretty, pretty sure my listeners are probably going to name it after a fighter. So let's see what you guys got out there. Make sure you use hashtag Pure Evil on May and shoot it at Pure Evil on May. I'm interested to see what you guys think. We had some pretty interesting guests come on the show this week. We had Valor Fight 38, which took place tonight. And uh, also Tough 19. Diego Lima interview this week. That was up on YouTube. So I didn't save it for the podcast. However, I got another interesting guest, another tough alumni who's going to be coming on. Hader Hassan, the Hulk. Perfect. With three first round wins, won four of his last six fights, with five of them winning by knockout. He's been training at ATT for the past seven years. We all know that Robbie Lawler trains at ATT. Um, one of his favorite idols was Muhammad Ali. I asked him about him passing. I make sure I got his scoop on McGregor versus Nate. Let's jump right into that interview with Hader Hassan. All right, guys, I got a special treat for you to start off tonight. For our Halloween night, Hader Hassan, the Hulk. What do you know? The Hulk is on the podcast on Halloween. What's going on, Hader? How you doing? Oh, uh, man, much love, man. I appreciate you having me on, man. Uh, 
All is good, man. Just got home uh, from a great productive day. And, uh, you know, man, dotting the I's, crossing the T's, man. So uh, all is great, man. Thank God, man. Well, for anyone out there who isn't familiar with Hader Hassan, he's 6-3, and three, won four out of his last six fights, and has five knockout wins, uh, three first-round wins, actually. And uh, you train over at ATT for the past, like, seven years, and you were just on Ultimate Fighter. Um, so what was that like? Bring everybody through that experience of being on Ultimate Fighter and, uh, you know, having to go across uh, the team that's, what, 10 minutes away from you over at uh, the Black Zillions. Yeah, man. You know what? It was uh... – the old, training at American Top Team, it doesn't get better than that. You know, you have the who's who uh, training there. So, um, you know, not only the coaches, but your teammates are are what makes you, you know. So um, it's a daily grind um, that ends up being uh, a blessing, man. I can't say anything more than that, you know, besides being a blessing. But uh, the Ultimate Fighter, I mean, man, that show, it is, it's the toughest competition in all of sports, let alone combat sports. I mean, uh the frequency of the frequency of the times you have to fight, you know, um, I mean, man, on that show, I fought three times in 17 days. Um, you know, actually I had a fight right before the ultimate fighter. I ended up fighting, which, which gave me four fights inside four in less than four months. Wow. Um, so like, honestly, for me, it was, uh, it was more of a battle of the wills personally, just because of, uh, everything that I was, I was, I had to put my body through, uh, the weight cut, weight cut, weight cuts, um, and uh, you know, and just overcoming adversity. That's why I'm all about challenging myself, man. So it was a uh, it was a challenge that I was happy to accept, but uh, it kind of ended up backfiring on me a little bit towards the end of the year, man. Because uh, I ended up I ended up having six fights, uh, a little over a in, in a little over 12 months. And um, you know, my, my after going into the finale, I really overtrained. I I thought, I, I thought it's, it's such a happy medium between overtraining and undertraining. And, you know, for that finale, when I fought Kamaru, I talked a lot of smack. Uh, so I wanted to – for me, talking smack is – it's uh, self-motivation, you know, for you to go out there and back it up. Uh, but you have to make sure that the problem where I messed up was that I I over – I over not only did I over MMA train, but I over conditioned and, uh, and only taking one day off, you know, training two, three times a day. Uh, it was ended up being uh, kind of a recipe for, for disaster. You know, I ended up being really, really weak in the fight. Um, and honestly, I kind of got thrown around like a rag doll because I was so physically weak. But, um, and then I fought Vicente and you know, when you lose and when you win, when you win a fight, you go home, you can rest with a peaceful mind. You can put your head on the pillow and you can, re and you can rest. Okay, cool. I can take this next one to two weeks off and I can do it with uh, peace of mind. But when you lose you don't have peace of mind, you know, you're like, I got to get back in the gym ASAP, you know, and you're in the being in the gym that, that you know, the, the same week you're, as of after, your, you know, after your fight's done. And I mean, man, still to this day, when it's three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, and I'm going to take a piss, I was going to use the restroom. <laughs> yeah. Literally, as I'm going to the bathroom, I'll be like, fuck, I'll be, you know, I'll be, cur you know, I'll still say, damn, you, I, you can I swear up. on here. You can swear. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. I didn't know. I didn't know the audience. Uh, so yeah, I mean, and I'll be like, damn, I, I, I fucked up, you know? And, uh, so that will never leave you, you know, it's just, uh, you need to come back and, uh, that's why I'm excited for this fight, man. You know, going into the Vicente fight, that was my sixth fight of the year. I was a little mentally run down and, uh, instead of being that animal that I am, you know, using my God given gift of power, um, you know, I, I didn't do that. I ended up, uh, being more more set to countering, um, because being in a, being an aggressive mindset when you go in there like I'm gonna I'm gonna work this dude I'm gonna beat him up whatever he thinks he's gonna whatever he thinks he's gonna hit me I'm gonna hit him ten times harder, you know you have to have that animal mindset but there's only so much of an animal you can be when you're fighting six times a year, three times seventeen days four fights inside four months you know like you're gonna be run down dude. I don't care who you are no one's superhero. You know, and it uh, just happened to Rhonda. I mean, she was fighting back to back, trying to keep up the promotions. Everyone keeps getting paid, and it uh, kind of backfired on her. You know? Yeah, and honestly, man, that's what happened to me, man. You know, and uh, I mean, hands down, I'm not taking anything away from Vicente, but when I'm when I'm healthy, I'll work Vicente, dude. You know, he couldn't even touch me, and I I, I gave him that gift. I gave him that that fight on a silver platter. And God bless him. He's a super talented fighter. He capitalized on it. Well, and while we're on the subject, last week all my listeners got to hear of uh, Vincente's next opponent, which is Bilal Muhammad. And uh, Bilal's original opponent dropped out, um, got some trouble with uh, USADA, Lyman Good. And uh, 
his new opponent is is Vincente Luque. How do you think that fight's going to go? I mean, what does Bilal have in store for him? Do you think he can win that fight? Yeah, you know what, man? Uh, Bilal, he's he's a, he's a fellow Arab, man. So I got nothing but love for my Arab, uh, Arab warriors, you know? Uh, so, um, but, you know, Vicente was my roommate, man, living in the house, man. So, yeah, Vicente was actually one of the closest guys on their team that I got, uh, that I got along with, man, you know? So I'm actually very, very cool with uh, Vicente. He's a good dude. Um, me and Bilal were actually supposed to fight last year uh, for, for the Titan uh, belt. But uh, I ended up – I had to pull out the fight because I ended up injuring my rib. Um, but, uh, honestly, stylistically, they're both, they're both, both great matchups. You know, um, Vicente likes to come forward and he's, he's looking to pick shots off, drop, uh, drop heavy combos, knees, kicks, and then he's got a phenomenal, uh, Darce, Darce, tri- Darce choke, yeah, the Darce choke. Uh, which is, which is an arm, arm triangle, um, that he is, I mean, that he's mastered, you know? So when you duck your head, if you're not doing it proper, or there's a hesitation in your level changes, and he grabs it, um, you know. You can be in a, you can be uh, in some trouble, as I as I, I found myself when I fought him. Um, but you know what, man, Bilal is a very technical striker. He's got a good jab, and against a guy that's going to be coming forward and putting pressure on you, the jab is uh, is key. You know, as long as you can, you know, touch in, touch out, come back in, and you're firing clean combinations. Um, you know, you can you can you can put the business out there, man. But uh, Honestly, I feel like the fight can go either way. Um, as far as power, I, I think maybe Vicente has a little bit more power. Uh, but uh, but Bilal, Bilal is a great fighter, man. God bless, you know, God bless both those guys, man. They're both studs. I, I, I tip my hat off to both those guys. It's going to be, I think it has very uh, fight of the night implications. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be excited to watch it. Well, it's going to be an amazing night. Not only is it fight in New York City for the first time for the UFC, but the main event is a super fight, pretty much, with uh, Conor McGregor aiming for, you know, to be a two-division champion at the same time. And I usually ask everyone this question. I want to know what you think about this fight coming up, and then we'll get into your uh, upcoming fight that you got. Cool, man. Yeah, uh, the whole card is stacked for UFC 205, man. I'm really excited, man. Uh, I'm excited to see my teammate Pitbull come out there and uh, debut at 155. Uh, the... the Every the whole card, the whole lineup is, is nasty. But uh, the McGregor Alvarez fight, um, man, you know what? It's gonna be. I think it's gonna be a really great fight, man. Sometimes Eddie Eddie can get a little wild, um, with his aggression, and um, when you're orthodox southpaw, Eddie being orthodox, McGregor being southpaw, and 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 the righty is being uh, a little wild. Uh, McGregor's really good at stepping to the left and counter countering with the cross as the as the guy. Because Orthodox is coming forward, so um, I feel like it's going to be a delicate balance between, um, you know, aggression and counter aggression. And uh, I feel like if it goes into later rounds, maybe maybe Eddie maybe Eddie uh, can take it. Because that one fight that Eddie Alvarez and Michael Chandler had in, in Bellator, I mean, that was a nonstop like cat fight. You know, they're just spinning, 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 blah, 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 nonstop, <laughs> nonstop action. You know. Yeah. Um. So uh, yeah, man. Honestly, the, the the winner for that fight is going to be uh, is going to be the fans and uh, whoever gets their hands hands raised. I feel like they're both going to be winners because they're both making buttloads of money. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, man. It's going to be a great fight, man. You know, uh, may the best man win. So it's Halloween. As soon as I called you, you had some kids running around the house. What what's going on there? Yeah, man. So I live with my brother. Uh, me and my brother, my brother Medi. He's he's fighting on the Titan card as well. Yeah, he's a professional fighter as well. Yep. Yeah, man. So we live together. He, uh, him, and his his wife. Uh, they have a two year old and a three month old. So, um, they, uh, the, the wife invited uh, some some family friends over with their kids, and they're about to go trick or treating. So, so when you I walk have in, like superheroes walking around your house right now. <laughs> yeah, I got I got a Superman. I got a Cinderella. I got a engine conduct conductor, <laughs> little uh, train man. So uh, it's it's cool, man. It's good to see uh, everyone enjoy the. Enjoy the festivities, man. You like you know, dressing but, up at all? Are you, are you gonna dress up or uh, go to any parties th- la- uh, last weekend? Or yeah, you know, I went to a little. Uh, one of my one of my coaches had a little Halloween party on Saturday, and I just came by to show some love. He's actually he's my neighbor, so I didn't get dressed. I was kind of lazy, but I just I just went to show my face and uh, show some love to to my coach. But uh, no, nah, man, I'm I'm too tired. I'm gonna be giving out candy. They're gonna come to me, and I'll give out some candy, and uh, so it'll be cool. Is I'll it- get to see that. I'll get to see the outfits. 
is the temptation real? Like, uh, like, do you crave chocolate, or are you not a chocolate guy? Man, you know what? Um, okay. Um, yeah, you know what, man? Honestly, I uh, my weight's my weight's pretty good. I've never been uh, a huge candy guy, but uh, I definitely don't mind a little a little uh, little chocolate here and there. But I, for the most part, I'll be chilling. You know, I, I'm gonna make make some good dinner, and then uh, you know, maybe I'll cheat with a couple pieces here and there. Yeah. <laughs> I won't tell anyone. Don't worry. O yeah. Only my listeners are gonna know. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I burned. I mean, I worked my ass off today, so uh, I got I got I got plenty of calories. I can I can put on. So what yeah. does your day look like? Like, can you bring all my listeners visually through a day in your shoes? Yeah, man. So today uh, we had wrestling practice uh, in the morning uh, from 11:30 to one. Um, which is the class is led by uh, Steve Mako, and uh, I mean Mako nice. is just is just a beast. And uh, I mean we got forty guys on the mat, you know, drilling and and working hard. So just the energy in the room is uh, is very contagious, and uh, and it just breeds success. So it's uh it, it's it's a lot of fun, man. I I've been really working on my game, and uh, I'm excited to show my improvements. Uh, and then after wrestling practice, I was back at the we finished up at one, and I was back at the gym at three thirty, and uh, I just got home at what, six, six fifteen. Uh, I put in some good mitt, mitt work, mitt rounds, orthodox southpaw, uh, worth work. And, uh, I put eight rounds in, uh, of mitt work. And, uh, yeah, man, I mean, I'm, I'm an, I'm an animal right now, man. You know, after the, after my sixth fight last year, um, I just needed to re hit reset, you know, and, 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 uh, not, and and go to bed not not thinking about oh man I'm fighting in I'm fighting next month blah, 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 you know and um, now I'm now I'm fully recharged you know I got that animal instinct back and uh, I'm ready to kill and uh, I'm excited to go out there right my wrongs and uh, make a statement. And December second, you're gonna be fighting for te uh, Titan FC 42, fighting against the undefeated uh, and correct me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, Adrius Capitulino. Yeah, I believe it's Adriano Capitolino. <laughs> I was close. Uh, yeah, man, he, he, he's a talented fighter, man. Talented guy from Brazil. Um, undefeated. Uh, tall guy. Goes orthodox in southpaw. Um, he likes to he likes to strike. He's got good jujitsu. So it, it's uh it's gonna be a great it's gonna be an exciting fight, man. Um, but honestly, it's just the wrong time to fight me. You know, um, I'm gonna give him his first loss, and I'm gonna put out I'm gonna do it in devastating fashion. Um, honestly, I know he's really motivated. I know he's looking at me like I'm um, his ticket to the UFC. You beat, you beat a guy with the name. Um, uh, but honestly, it's just the wrong time to fight me. And, um, I don't know. I just have that killer instinct back. I've, 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 I've learned how to train smarter. I'm not overtraining anymore. And, uh, that only can come from you making mistakes. You know, the sport is such a game of inches, uh, you, you know, and, uh, yeah, just like anything in life, trial and error. You know, when you make your errors, you make it, you get back out there and you make your corrections. And um, so that's why I'm excited. You know, me for me, this is like this is my first fight coming back in, in a little over a year. So for me, every day, multiple times a day, I've been thinking about my mistakes in my last fight. So I've been thinking about that for a year, every day, multiple times a day, my mistakes, what I did wrong, what I need to do. And uh, I'll tell you what, man, I'm not going to make my mistakes anymore. I'm going to go out there like a ruthless killer assassin. I'm going to bust this dude up. December 2nd, I'm looking forward to this. It's going to be on UFC Fight Pass. And we just spoke with uh, uh, Jose Shorty Torres. He was on last week. And I'm looking forward to that. On um, this season of Ultimate Fighter right now, they're all training to beat Mighty Mouse Johnson. Have you been, have you been following along with this or... Yeah, man, I've been catching good glimpses of it. I had two teammates on the show, uh, Jeremy and uh, Matt. Matt Schnell, I believe. Is oh, all right, yeah, Matt. And uh, yeah, man, you know, I'm proud of those guys. You know, it, it's the Ultimate Fighter is it's the toughest competition, man. So you really have to. It's also even a lot of luck that goes into it. If you if you're able to stay healthy through the through the tournament, and um, yeah, man, you know, it's a lot of pressure too, but, you know, when you're looking at pressure, you just have to have a positive relationship to it, man. I always say, you know, because as you progress in your career, the pressure is just going to be getting more and more intense. You're making more money, you're doing pay-per-views and whatnot. So I always say, like, you know, when you look at pressure, you need to marry pressure. You want you want pressure to be your wife 
you know, and you want to make sweet love to it. Anytime you're making sweet love to pressure, you're going to look at it in a positive mindset, you know? So uh, you, you want more pressure, you know, like that, that is it really, you want to be like, is that what pressure feels like? Because to me, I don't feel like nothing, you know? And, and when you have that harmonious uh, balance with pressure, then uh, only good things can happen. It's been a crazy year in MMA, but in the fight scene in general, I know that one of your idols is uh, Muhammad Ali, who just passed away this year. How did you react to that when, when that happened? Yeah, man, you know, my middle name's Ali. Um, yeah, Muhammad Ali, man, he, you know, he, he's the greatest, you know, and uh, I actually, I watched his whole funeral on, on TV, man, and just watched, you know, I saw the every, every faith, you know, from Buddhist to Native American to you know, Jewish to Muslims to Christianity, every faith came out there and spoke um, about him. And I just thought that was so beautiful. And uh, the true meaning of, you know, all religions, you know, being, you know, being based on humanity, you know, and uh, all, we're all one. And uh, and no one no one did that better than, than Muhammad Ali, man. So, uh, yeah, man, God bless him. It was a beautiful thing. I think it was a uh, very humbling experience for everyone that watched and uh saw what he went through and um yeah man got you know god rest his soul and he's the man i'm trying you know i've been working a lot of orthodox southpaw going going that direction when you're going to the i I call it the ali way (laughs) you know um you know where you're where you're where you're striking on the move going the jab check hook way so even if the guy's coming putting pressure on you i'm still moving at the angle and firing high 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 volume combination um, so yeah, I, mean, I got a lot of moves based off, based off of Muhammad Ali and, uh, I like to throw in some Pacquiao in there with the in and out angles and, uh, come finish them up with some Mike Tyson overhand hook, finishing power shots. So honestly, I, I, my, I, I, I base my style after, after all the greatest fighters. You watch a lot of film, uh, like on your fighters, uh, on your opponents coming into a fight or do you not really like to do that? Yeah. You know, I, I, I do watch film. I, I am a student of the game. Um, when I watch film, I just look for tendencies. I, I look at I look at athleticism. Um, are they more of a fast twitch fi- Are they more fast twitch fibers? Are they stiff, robotic? Uh, what do they like to lead with? You know, any type of uh, any mistakes that I can see that will benefit me. Um, so I really like to break out. Do they push their Do they push their punches, or are they sitting on them really really well? Are they a straight puncher? Are they overhand hook person? So these are all little, little things that I'd like to see. Um, so for sure, man, I think it's important to uh, to study your opponents. I, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's that that important to overwhelm yourself with what your opponent's going to do um, because you don't want to shortchange yourself. Or the, or the bottom line, you have to go out there and impose your will on the opponent. But it's important to know what the other guy likes to do, so uh, you know you can dye your eyes and cross your t's and just nullify everything he does. And then whatever he does do, you're gonna make him punish. You're gonna punish him for with everything he does. So as yeah. we get to the end of our interview, I gotta ask you this: Is there still any tension between you and any of the Black Zillions if you are in the same room? Oh man, you know what? I feel like there's always will be that like uh, weirdness in the room, yeah. you know. But um, but honestly, man, at least on on my side, you know. I, when you live with all, when you live with all these guys, um, you know, you see the human side of it, you know, and honestly, this sport is so hard, um, that you really, you have to respect every fighter because the grind is real, you know, and anyone who's willing to put, put them, their bodies, their minds through that grind, you know, you got to respect the hell out of them, you know? So, uh, you know, I respect all, I, I respect everyone that I competed against and, uh, everyone over at the Black Zillions, um, maybe they might have something different to say about me. But, uh, I mean, for the most part, I'll tell you what, do I want to fight Kamaru again? Fuck yeah. I want to beat his, I want to whoop that ass, you know? Do I want to fight Vicente again? Hell yeah. I want to, I want to write my wrongs because I know I'm better than those guys. Um, and I know for sure it's not if I get, when to, if I get to UFC, it's when I get to UFC. And as long as I go out there and I put highlight real finishes on guys, there's no denying, uh, my spot at the table. Well, five wins by knockout, three first round wins. I'm excited for December 2nd for Titan FC 42. What I usually like to do at this point in the interview is I hand the imaginary microphone over to my guest. If you have any shout outs or anything that I missed or anything you want to say, any uh, shout outs, like I said, uh, the floor is now yours, brother. 
yeah, man, you know, I just want to thank, uh, you know, American Top Team. Uh, man, they've had my back through thick and thin, my family, uh, all my supporters, my fans. I, I have such a great fan structure, man. Everyone has been having my back for a long time. Uh, my brother, my brother's the man. We've been pushing each other every single day to get ready for this fight. And, um, yeah, man, most importantly, man, I'm going to I'm gonna earn my way back, and this time I'm staying. And uh, anyone who's in my way, I'm putting a tombstone on that on their on their name, you know. So uh, whoever, whenever, wherever, let's let's get down to business. Well, I had a great time talking with you. Happy Halloween! Thanks for taking time out of your day or night to uh, come on. I know you got some trick or treaters and uh, some superheroes running around your house. All my listeners were so excited uh, that you were coming on. General Yusuf, one of uh, one of our hardcore listeners, was so excited. So thank you for coming on. I'll talk to you soon, brother. And good luck come December 2nd. We'll all be watching. Thanks, man. Much love, bro. I appreciate the time. And thanks for uh, letting me share my story, man. You're the man. This is Haider Hassan, and you're listening to Pure Evil MMA. So there you go, guys. Tough alumni coming on the show. Always love talking with them. It's cool watching them on that season, whatever season they're on. And the Black Zillion versus ATT. I mean, come on. How many people are watching that season? That was a great season of fights. So, Angie Jabs just got home, and I know I just told you guys that we got a new rat. She walks in the door and tells me that uh, she hates where she lives. I go, why do you hate where you live? Because we can't have any pets. We, and let me remind you guys, if, you, if, if I have any new listeners in here, it originally started with one. One rat. We were babysitting her friend Hannah's rats, and she fell in love with them. I kind of did too, but I wasn't all about having... Uh, the rat balls on my shoulder so we decided that she or she decided that she was going to bring home a rat on her birthday and surprise me since it was the birthday i couldn't be the jerk that said no she came home surprised me with that first rat let you guys all know this earlier on in my earlier episodes well now we have eight rats i think i think we have seven or eight rats right now one of them's really cool lives on the couch has a potty sleeps with me every night that one's cool we got another baby one, which I want you guys to name, so make sure you let us know on Twitter. But she told me that she does not like where she lives because we can't have pets, even though we have eight rats, and that somebody is willing to give her a baby puppy shih tzu. So now I'm in this position again where I don't know what the hell I'm going to say or do, but here, once again, a week later, she wants another pet, so... I don't know. What do you guys think about this? Should I say yes or should I say no? Let me know at Pure Evil MMA. We got another interview coming up with Valor38. Sawyer Rich, who's going to be fighting Valor38, and it's going to be live streaming on Flow Combat November 5th uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. But here's our interview with with uh, Sawyer Rich. Check it out. Right, our second guest of the night, Sawyer Rich on right now, who's going to be fighting... For Valor Fights 38, coming up November 5th in Nashville, Tennessee. What's going on, Sawyer? How are you doing tonight? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Man. I just did the gym, working some wrestling, working some boxing, uh, weight cutting two weeks out. So, I mean, I'm feeling pretty good, though. And this is going to be going on November 5th on Flow Combat. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So, what do you know about your opponent? Uh, Combo Stewart, I know he's got a real solid wrestling background, uh, he's short, uh, stocky, real strong, um, uh, real athletic guy, and I'm sure he's gonna bring it, but so am I, so, so we'll see what happens. So, in an interview that your opponent did, Cromwell Stewart, uh, he did an interview with Pro MMA Now, and he was quoted saying that, my opponent, and I quote, my opponent is a tough kid, he's a grinder, he's a really scrappy kid, it should be a tough kid, but I'm going to come out on top. What do you have to say back to that? Oh, I mean, he's absolutely right. I mean, I fight best when, I, when the fights are gone, when, it, when people mix it up. Uh, I, I tend to do worse, you know, my worst when when I just fought a straight wrestler, a straight boxer. Uh, I, I, the best comes out of me as a fighter when someone mixes it up with me. So he's absolutely right. I mean, I'm, I'm scrappy. I grind, and uh, I think if I'm making a grind, then I can definitely come out on top of this fight. So it's Halloween week this week, and the theme for this week's podcast, of course, is Halloween. What did you like uh, dressing up as a kid? Did you go out trick or treating first off? Oh, well, actually, I'm, I'm gonna dress up this weekend. I dress up every year, so 
this year, I'm dressing up as uh, Pyramid Head from Silent Hill. He's one of my favorite uh, video game characters, or characters anyway. Pretty spooky guy, so uh, I've been working on that. So I don't know if I'll go to trick-or-treating. I think someone's having a pre-pot party for me, so that's what I'm going to hit up, probably. There you go. And what's your favorite Halloween movie? Mine, growing up, was I was always afraid of Freddy Krueger. I always had nightmares about Freddy Krueger. Uh, Chucky, It. What were some of yours? Uh, you just mentioned uh, Pennywise the Clown uh, from It. That's actually my favorite book. Uh, Stephen King's one of my favorite all-time authors. Probably my favorite all-time author. Um, I'm going to have to go with Pennywise. I think he's creepy. He's everything that you fear in one. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I hate your own I guess. What's it like uh, out in Tennessee? You're from Tennessee, correct? Yes, sir. And I'm I... from Tennessee, boy. Uh, Tennessee, man, uh, it's, I come from a real small town. I mean, it's simple, simple life. I mean, there's really no, no highways or anything like that. The biggest thing we have around here is the Walmart, and that's kind of like the center of attention. It's like the Monopoly. So there's really no other stores around here besides the Walmart. So, uh, you can either go to the gym or, I mean, you can sit home and play video games. There's really nothing to do in my hometown besides trains, so it's good for me. Is there, um... Besides Walmart, is there, like, a lot of mom-and-pop shops? Oh, uh, yeah, there's, like, you know, uh, locally-owned restaurants and stuff like that, little, little hick stores. Uh, don't quote me on that. I don't want to call anybody hick, but, I mean, I guess I am. But, uh, I mean, it, it's just, I come from a little little town that no one's heard of, man, and it's called Jamestown, Tennessee. So, I mean, a real small population, uh, born and raised here. Uh, that's what I'm finding out. I'm actually training in a place called Cookville, about 30 miles away. So, but um, I mean, I'm I'm residing in Jamestown. Uh, I just I feel best when I when I'm close to home when I'm training for a fight. I just I don't feel drained or, or under pressure. I just I feel good. So this is now what your your third fight with or your first fight for Valor fights, correct? No, sir. This is my fifth fight for Valor. Oh, okay. What I and it's my second pro fight. Okay, it's your second pro fight. So you actually have quite the history to you before uh, any of the the pro fights or anything happened. Can you tell some of my listeners a little bit about yourself? What you did uh, before MMA? Oh man, um, well before MMA period. Well, just before your pro career. Okay, before I'm broke you, well, I started out fighting in Kentucky. I had my first fight right after I turned 18. I won by the knockout. I went on a three-fight win streak. I lost one. Uh, this this all happened within about a year and a half. I went I went five and two in a year and a half. And then I won a couple more fights. I ended my amateur career seven and two. And I also won a couple kickboxing bouts. Uh, so I decided that it was, it was time to go pro after I had about 11 fights under my belt. I had a, I had a, I, I feel like I did it right, and a lot of people, I think, go pro too soon, but, uh, I feel like I had enough experience going in. Well, with all the, uh, people that are getting signed this year to the UFC, Sage Northcutt, um, Cody East, um, Nikki Gall, you know, just to name a few from Dana White looking for a fight. How does it feel, you know, being on a, a smaller promotion to have somebody like Dana White go out himself to scout fighters and you see these young fighters getting signed, you you being one of them, um, how, how does this uh, play out in your head? Like, do you think uh, if they came to see you fight come November 5th, would they pick you out of the crowd? I hope so. I think, well, the thing about it is, is I bring more to the table than the normal person. I'm, I'm entertaining. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very... I, I get the crowd involved. I make it exciting. Um, I, I'm not only there to fight, I'm there to put on a show. Uh, I want to I wanna end this fight in devastating fashion. I want to go out there. I want to I wanna make this fight my own. I'm not going to let him fight his fight. I'm going to take it to him. I'm going to bring it to him. I'm going to get the KO. Um, I'm always looking for the KO. I always make it exciting. So, so yeah, I think if uh, Dan Wild was, uh, was a scout, and I think he'd, yeah, I would definitely stand out in this show for sure. So tell my listeners a little bit about what this fight camp has been like for you and what you've really been focusing a lot of your time on with uh, your skills. Like, what have you been really trying to tweak out? Well, I mean, like I said before, uh, Cromwell Stewart, the guy I'm fighting on November 5th, is a wrestler. Um, he's got a real strong wrestling base. It's no secret what he's going to try to do. He's going to try to take me down. Kind of the classic grappler versus striker matchup. Um He's going to come out and try to take me down. Um, I think he's going to tire. 
I think he's going to get uh, tired uh, after the first round, maybe into the second round. I'm not going to get tired. I'm going to continue to bring it. Um, we've been uh, working on a whole lot of takedown defense, a whole lot of getting back up to our feet from guard, getting back up off the cage, um, just cutting the angle and, and landing the shot. And uh, I think the knockout's going to come for sure. Like you were saying earlier in the interview, your opponent – used to play some college football and some arena football and we've seen this in the UFC with fighters like OSP coming out from uh I think he's from Tennessee actually yeah, he's from there you go so you know with his style specifically when we see uh an athlete that hasn't trained MMA their entire life that played football you kind of see some of that play into their game are you expecting that like uh somewhat of an unpredictability with him it's not really a traditional uh kickboxer or, or Muay Thai or or anything. He's just uh, kind of his own kind of a fighter. Um, you know, you said he's a great wrestler. You're expecting him to maybe take you down. But are you expecting the unexpected from him? Um, like you said, you know, he played football. He, he's played, you know, a few different sports, I think, besides football. He's a football coach. He used to be a wrestling coach, I believe. And uh, I think he may still, still currently be a high school wrestling coach. Um, but like you said, yeah, he's, I'm expecting him to come out and be super, super athletic. I think he's going to be real strong. I think in the clips, he's going to be real strong. He's going to try to bully me. But, uh, I mean, we're prepared for that. I'm expecting it. So, uh, you know, I hope he does. I hope he comes out and tries to bully me because he's going to get a reawakening. So a little bit about yourself. What's your uh, home life like? Do you have any pets at home? Do you have a fiance? Do you have, uh... An annoying mother-in-law. Tell us a little bit about your uh, home life. Uh, well, I live with my girlfriend uh, a few years, so uh, that's probably about to. I'm probably about to ask her. Uh, probably about to try to tell the not here after this spot. I've just got so much, so much going on with this spot. Definitely looking to take the next step with her. Uh, she's super supportive. Uh, better, I mean. She's at home or at work, and I'm at the gym. I never see her. I haven't really saw her for the last nine, ten weeks in the spot camp. It's killing her. It's killing me. I have a uh, 15-year-old wiener dog, who's Monster Meyer, who's my world. I've had him since uh, he was uh, three months old. He's super, super old. He gets around good, but uh, he usually sleeps all the time. So I come home. He's usually in bed, and uh, I usually let him play PlayStation with him get home from the gym uh he, he's super cool he's my best friend and uh I, I have a really really good home life i mean i have my dad and my mom they're super supportive of what i'm doing with mma both my brothers are nurse practitioners they they used to fight they used to be pro fighters they uh they had an early pro career uh and they they decided to pursue something else because uh, they were getting a little bit older so uh, I've just I've got a really 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 good home support um, going into this fight. My career just they love what I'm doing. So one of my last interviews I did was with Philip Nover, who everyone knows as the Nurse Fighter. So yeah, you're saying that your brothers are are RNs. What are you planning on doing after your pro career? Well, I'm actually uh, planning on finishing a nursing school. I started nursing school. Uh, I got a uh, um, well, I got pretty far into it, and I only lack a little bit, so I'm going to I'm gonna go back probably after uh, March and finish that up. I like a year my RN, so I'll, uh, I'll probably finish that up, and uh, I'll pursue fighting at the same time, but when you do something like that, you kind of got to put one of them on the back burner for just a second, you know? Because you've got you've to gotta commit to that, because that's a uh, nursing school is no joke, man, so... That's, uh, that's probably what I'm going to do just to have that to fall back on, but, but fighting is the number one priority. Yeah, I actually went to uh, EMT school. My mom's a nurse for Yale Hospital here in Connecticut, oh, and wow, okay. she makes a good paycheck, man, like $40 an hour to work overnight. And not to yep. mention, you'll still be able to work in the gym somewhat if you wanted to when you got older because you can go around to the fights. Maybe you can be uh, the next Stitch Durand in your 50s, you know? Yeah, well, I hope, I hope I'm on the other end of it, but that's, that's the plan. So, within your uh, career as a fighter, who have been some of your influences? Like, what got you interested in fighting? Uh, BJ Penn, man. BJ Penn's my boy. Uh, he's uh, in his prime. I don't think that anybody could touch him. Uh, 
I used to watch him, and he used to, it was just, I wanted to be like him growing up. And I started, I started boxing and doing MMA when I was 10, 11 years old, and I started doing it seriously when I was like 14, 15. So I've been doing this a long time. I've seen a lot of fighters come and go in the game uh, on the big stage. And uh, BJ Penn, of course, I like John Jones. I think uh, I love Evan Dunham. Uh, I think he's slick. Damian Maya. I love all those. All those are influenced. Uh, I like going to, uh, to these local shows. Not not really local, I don't guess, but I mean the smaller shows, rather. And, and seeing that talent, that, that motivates me. Because those guys, they just have to drive because they haven't made it yet. And I feel like that that talent, I don't know, I, I just I feel like that they have something more. They have something to prove. And that just that drives me seeing that. So in 2016, a lot more people are opening up to mixed martial arts in their home, watching it um, you know, on their televisions. And we saw this a lot with the Ultimate Fighter. We saw this a lot with um, you know, anything that the UFC has been doing, but a lot here in 2016. Now we have Bellator signing some big names. Would you be interested in the next couple of years or or rather do you see yourself in the next couple of years being signed with Bellator or the UFC? Um, I hope. I mean, that's the goal. That's every pro fighter's goal. I mean, that's why we're doing this. I mean, uh, they want to make it to the next level. I definitely want to progress. I mean, of course, I want to progress when I'm ready. But I've, like you said, in the next year, a couple of years, yeah, I think I'd, I could definitely see myself getting signed, something like that. Um, I'm, I'm, like I said, I have a three, I'm on a three, five deal with Valor Fox right now. I want to finish my, uh, I got to fight my third fight in the contract. This, this is my second fight coming up November 5th. I got to fight my third fight in the contract by March, which I'll probably do it sooner. And uh, hopefully I'll go three and no. You know, I'm not looking past anybody. I'm not, not building my record before it happens, but, but uh, that's the goal, to build a perfect record and, and get signed by one of these promotions. And we were talking about video games earlier in the interview as well. And as we get to the end of the interview, actually, um, we were speaking about video games. What uh, what video games do you like playing? And, and uh, what was your favorite video game growing up? Oh, man, I am a game nerd. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you got time, but no. <laughs> uh, the new Final Fantasy is coming out. Um, we're stoked about it. I'm a huge role-playing game fan. Uh I uh, love all the Squaresoft stuff, Final Fantasy VII, Chrono Trigger, all the retro RPGs. I like the Pokemon games, um, Resident Evil. I love all that shit. I love all the, the old retro stuff coming out. I like Gears of War today. Um, that just came out. It's pretty balling. Um, I, I can play just about anything, but, but I prefer role-playing. Yeah, I like role-playing games, too. I remember when the Game Boy came out and the Pokemon... That blew yeah. up for a while when I was a kid. We had some crazy uh, things growing up. And now these kids got uh, smartphones at the age of eight years old with uh, the world literally at their fingertips. It's just absolutely... Yeah, it's crazy. It's literally like the Jetsons. It really is. Yeah, it is. I don't understand. I never got a cell phone. Actually, I think I stole my father's cell phone when I was 15. And that's how I originally first got my communication with a cell phone. <laughs> And they eventually, they're like, well, he's going to use mine anyway, so we're going to get him one. So, this year, there's been a lot of crazy fights. There's been a lot of uh, huge fight announcements, of course. Tito Ortiz versus Chael Sonnen in, in the mix now for Bellator. But one of the main things that we've been talking about lately is UFC 205, Conor McGregor versus Eddie Alvarez. My listeners will literally ring me by the neck if I don't ask everybody I interview what their take on this is. Who are you leaning towards? Are you Team Connor or are you Team Alvarez? Well, I mean, if you would have asked me a year ago, I probably would have been Alvarez because of the size difference. But, I mean, Gregor's put on a lot of muscle. He's a lot bigger. I don't even know that he could make 45 now. But, I mean, I think, uh, of course, Connor has the boxing the striking advantage. I'm, I see Connor tagging him. Eddie rushing him and getting tagged and over and over. I just I don't know that Eddie can can take it long enough to get him down and hold him there for for five rounds. So I, I don't see Eddie finishing him. And I just I, I'm I'm leaning toward Connor, man. I hate to say it because I don't really like him, but I just I don't think that this is a good matchup for him. Either way, love him or hate him, you're still gonna end up watching because it's Conor McGregor, right? <laughs> I mean, I want to see him get a D, but I don't 
don't think it's going to happen. So, yeah, on the same podcast, I've talked with you, uh, Jose Shorty Torres, and I'm supposed to be speaking with Bilal Mohammed, who was actually supposed to be on right before you just came on. But unfortunately, he had some uh, breaking news tonight that his opponent, Lyman Good, was pulled out from a dirty uh, test found out by USADA. So we're going to have to see what happens with his fight. What other fights on the UFC 205 card are you excited to see? Is it the Frank Edgar versus, uh, um, who's he fighting? He's fighting, um, who the fuck is that guy? Uh, Stiffen. Uh, uh, dude, the thing about it is, is you'll ask fighters, I ask fighters all the time, like I'll be a cop for a fight. And, dude, being a fighter, I don't give a shit about anybody else fighting. I mean, I'll, I'll watch it, but at the same time, I don't keep up with it like the fan would. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I'm just like, oh, my God, I don't know. I just give this shit right now because I have my own fight. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I but, totally feel you. Uh, I see, but of course, I'm going to watch it. Uh, you mentioned Frankie Edgar, and I know who he's fighting. I can't I can't. Yeah, it's it. Jeremy Stevens. Right now. It's Jeremy Stevens. I was mix no, mixing he's gonna, up. He's gonna fuck Jeremy Stevens up. But I mean, it, he's gonna, dude. Uh, Frankie Edgar has some of the best boxing in the game. He's one of the best fighters alive to ever fight. I think. I think he's just his wrestling, his drive. He's that athletic. He's an animal, and I think he's. I mean, I'm not saying. I mean, Jeremy Stevens is awesome, but I mean, he, he's gonna kill Jeremy Stevens. He's not even in the same league, so. So as we close out our interview, what are some lasting words that you would like your opponent to hear if your opponent's uh, listening in right now? And I'm sure he will. What would you like him to know? Um, I hope he's listening. <laughs> and uh, Cromwell Stewart, November 5th, I'm going to come, uh, I'm going to come to Nashville. I'm going to embarrass you in front of your hometown, boy. Well, there you go. I can't wait for it. It's going to be November 5th. And it's Valor Fights 38. Where do you see yourself um, coming out of this fight? Do you see it ending in the first round, second round, or are you just the guy who really doesn't like to predict? You're just going to play it by ear. Uh, I always predict. I always predict. I mean, uh, and uh, I've called it the same time in every interview that I've had the same same way. Around TKO, stop it. TKO, TKO stoppage? Yep. All right, so at this point in the interview, I hand the imaginary microphone over to my fighter of the night, which is you right now. If there's anything that I missed, if there's any sponsors, anything that you want to say to people out there listening, now is your time. All right, I've got a bunch of sponsors, so forgive me if I go over. Um, the floor is yours, brother. Uh, it's uh, Johnny Walker, attorney, uh, out of Nashville, Studio 819 Tattoos out of Cookville. Come get to me. They do all my work. Uh, Cody Yard Auto Sales, DNA Bell Bonding, uh, Your Fight, Intimidation Clothing. Um, oh, God. Uh, Southeastern Drywall, uh, Tall Brothers Incorporated, Gaudi Fight Gear, Indo Athletics. Uh, I know I'm gonna. I know I'm forgetting somebody. Extreme Arms out of Jamestown, 879 Arms. Um, that's it. That's all I got. Uh, come watch this show. Uh, there's gonna be some badass fights. My fight's gonna be badass. I'm gonna end it. I'm gonna get the win. Uh, hopefully gonna get the KO. Come out, Nashville, November 5th, uh, Fairgrounds Arena. All right. So there's Sawyer Rich, who actually fought tonight. I do not know the actual outcome of it, but I really hope that he got that win like he predicted. And he's going to be fighting in uh, a couple of months as well. So make sure you guys all check out Sawyer Rich for Valor Fights. You might see him on the your next local circuit. So make sure you check it out. And like he was just saying about Jeremy Stevens, Frankie Edgar. Frankie Edgar is one of the best. Let's not forget that Frankie knocked out Chad Mendez in the first round uh, in his last, well, not his last fight, but the fight before last. His last fight was against Jose Aldo, and he just... Couldn't penetrate all those walls. Although, I set on the prize, which is Conor McGregor. And he got pretty, pretty pissed off that he did not get that fight before Eddie Alvarez did. But I like what he, I like what Sawyer Rich had to say about the Eddie Alvarez fight against Conor. Conor's gained so much more muscle now. And he's light years ahead of where he was at the beginning of the year. I'll tell you that much. He built a lot of muscle mass. He doesn't even think that he can make 145 again. I don't either. And now he's looking sharp as hell, beating Nate Diaz, 
one of the best fights so far this year. And we're going to have to wait and see. And that's actually going to be next week. But tomorrow is RDA, or if you're listening to this now, tonight is RDA versus Tony Ferguson. I'm looking forward to this. Sam Alvey on the card. Diego on the card. I cannot wait. RDA versus Tony Ferguson. Here's what Minion had to say for our warm-up this week. Minion, you there, brother? Yeah, cheers, Eddie. Today's going to be a straightforward one because, as you said, this Saturday night, we're back to UFC business. October's been a long month for some of you, void of UFC action, so I hope you've made the most of your free weekends, catching up with family and friends and whatnot, because although it's already November, there's still another 10 UFC events ahead of us, only taking Christmas weekend off in the run-up to the new year, and this stacked UFC feast to finish off 2016 will start with a tasty little amuse bouche this Saturday, November 5th, taking us down to Mexico City for the tough Latin America 3 finale, a solid little card on paper that has been upgraded by the addition of certain fighters from the recently cancelled Manila card and it will see yet another ultimate fighter crowned and earn their six-figure contract with the UFC. Having battled through all the other lightweights on the third season of the Latin American version of the talent spotting reality show, this season was somewhat randomly coached by English-speaking UFC legends Forrest Griffin and Chuck Liddell and it intends to introduce yet another new wave of UFC talent for the fans, this time coming from south of the border. But for those of you who haven't subtitled your way through the the entire season beforehand in the lead up to this season's finale, you can still get fired up about the simply unmissable main event potential lightweight title eliminator fight that's headlining the card. Rafael Dos Anjos versus Tony Ferguson, a match that's simply too close to call for some of the fans, but one way or another, somebody's making a statement this Saturday at the top end of that £155 shark tank. And just one week before the division's newly crowned champion, Eddie Alvarez looks to make his first defense against Conor McGregor at UFC 205 November 12th. But this week, the ex-champion, RDA, whose bruised or broken foot cancelled his own red panty night fight with McGregor, will be hoping to get right back into title shot talk by eliminating El Kukui from the equation. On the verge of being considered a UFC vet, having made his UFC debut way back in 2008, after a loss to Namagomedov in 2014, something seemed to change in RDA and he went on a run that saw him destroy Jason High, Benson Henderson and Nate Diaz before putting a beat down on Anthony Pettis for five rounds to be become the lightweight champion. He then took only a minute and six seconds to TKO future Hall of Famer Donald Cowboy Cerrone in his first defense before Alvarez proved that he is in fact human by taking his title from him at Fight Night 90 this July. Now looking to bounce back and prove that he's still a force to be reckoned with, RDA is capable of imposing his will on any fighter inside of that octagon and he has accepted anything but a tune-up fight for his comeback taking on the third ranked Tony Ferguson. The lightweight killer's row standout who's currently sat on an incredible eight fight win streak without having already earned his own title shot yet. And with a victory over RDA, he'll be hoping that this is enough to cement himself above Namagamedov for the next crack at the belt. Of his 12 fights in the UFC, the Tough 13 winner has only ever dropped a unanimous decision to Michael Johnson way back in 2012. And since then, he has simply been on a tear, only ever leaving it in the hands of the judges once after that. And he's a fighter who can as easily knock you out as he can submit you. Motivate by not only beating anyone that's put in front of him, El Kukui wants the finish as well, pocketing himself an impressive seven post-fight bonuses for his crowd-pleasing approach. Not one to cry about his title shot, Ferguson is happy to simply clean out the division one fighter at a time, confident that when his time comes, he's got the skills to claim that lightweight crown for himself. Now it's difficult to speculate on what a win for either of these formidable lightweights could mean until UFC 205 is in the history books. There's no real indication as to who Alvarez would prefer his second defence to be against and McGregor has hinted at a big announcement should he achieve his dream of becoming a simultaneous dual weight champion. And equally, the number one ranked Namagomedov is looking to make his own statement against Michael Johnson on that same card. But all that UFC 205 talk is for next week. This weekend's all about the tough Latin America 3 finale and for many fans they are simply happy to have made it through October and are ready to get stuck into the upcoming UFC marathon. But if I've got to give my pick for this main event, although it's quite possible we'll see a reinvigorated RDA come into this one with a roaring fire up his ass. the stats tend to go against a dethroned champion. But regardless of that, I'm still swaying towards El Kukui here, a confident, deadly, diverse, talented finisher. He tends to fight up to competition, but he always turns up and puts on a show for the fans.
Wales and it would be a shame to see such a win streak be snapped just because he's willing to step up and prove himself against anyone instead of pissing and moaning about the title shot he should have already received. But I hand it back over to you now Eddie and I'm interested to hear what you've got for this one as I know we don't always see eye to eye when it comes to fights that are as close as this one is. But just to sign off with the listeners first, give me a follow on Twitter if you want to talk some MMA. You can find some original content on my YouTube channel or check out my weekly MMA column on kobizcorner.com. Mignon, M-I-N-I-O-N, Mugrognon, M-C-G-R-O-G-N-O-N. Have yourselves a great fight week, MMA fans, and I'll catch you sometime on the other side of that bell. Well, gee, Minion, I gotta agree with you this week. I mean... Ah, it's so close here, and RDA really needs this win over El Kukui, and coming off a knockout loss of his last fight, where he lost the belt against Eddie Alvarez, I mean, he's got a lot of pressure on his shoulder. I mean, no one wants to lose their belt and then lose another one. Look what happened to Holly Holm. Now she's buried deep, back down to where she started before she fought uh, Ronda. Like, come on, you need to win this one, but El Kukui, we all wanted to see him fight Khabib, and if he beat Khabib, then he was able to go for that belt, but however... However, one of my favorite words, if he, he's looking at this fight first off like a title fight. He originally wanted this fight against RDA because RDA is the one who held the belt for a while, you know, after his win over Showtime Pettis. This is Tony Ferguson's title fight here, and he's going to put on a show just like Minion said. I'm going to give everybody my full prediction and breakdown, but earlier in this card, it's starting off with a bang guy, Sam Alvey. It's a mile in Sam Alvey taking on Alice Nicholson. And this is going to be a barn burner right here. Way to start off the uh, the night on Fight Pass. Alex Nicholson, knockout artist himself, but Sam Alvey. And this is like his fourth fight this year. He uh, won his last two fights by knockout. Or one by knockout, one by submission over Tough 22 uh, alumni. But you know what? Sam Alvey has one of the hottest wives out there. He just had a baby. He's been uh, knocking dudes out left and right. Always putting on a show. I love his post-fight speech. Is one of my favorite things to... Uh, to review, it's right out of the WWE or a comic book character, Sam Alvey. But Alex Nicholson, tough dude, man. He uh, just beat Devin Clark not too long ago. But here, Sam Alvey has a higher input uh, output, especially with uh, landed per minute. I mean, 3.78 landed per minute against uh, Alex Nicholson, 2.98. Now, I don't like talking MMA math. I am highly against it. I do not recommend it for any of the betters out there. If you're trying to look at the MMA math, it's it's you're just not going to formulate a good uh, equation out of it because it just doesn't add up. We've seen debut fighters take out some of the best out there. Look at uh, look at this, this season of Ultimate Fighter. We just had uh, Brandon Marino take out uh, Hawaii's own Smoka. I mean, come on. You, you just can't do it. And I don't recommend it. But here, Sam Alvey has, has more output when uh, landed per minute. Accuracy, he has better accuracy and better defense. And he puts on the best face too. When Sam Alvey, and watch tonight, when he throws a punch, when he's throwing those haymakers, he makes this like mean, angry toddler face where he like pulls down his front lip and his teeth come out and he just looks like he's throwing a tantrum. And then dudes just get shook from it. So Alex Nicholson versus Sam Alvey. I'm leaning for Sam Alvey here. He's a current record of 28 and 8. Alex Nicholson, a record of 7 and 2. Without a doubt. Way to start off the fight pass. Sam Alvey to win this by knockout. Also on this card, uh, Marco Beltran versus Joe Soto. Joe Soto, one of my favorites, uh, with a 16-5 record going against Marco Beltran, the psycho, 8-4. and four. I got to go Joe Soto here. I mean, it's just, uh, it's, it's he, once again, he has a more of an output. His accuracy is so-so, and his takedown average is, isn't that good, but I just think that this fight is most likely going to go into a, uh, a submission win for Joe Soto. And then we got Alexa Grasso versus Heather Joe Clark, the Hurricane. Heather Joe Clark just lost her last fight against, uh, I think, Lauren. Or no, lost her last fight against uh, Carolina Kowakowicz. How could I forget? Who's also going to be fighting on that UFC 205 card against Joanna Champion. And this is a big comeback fight for Heather Joe Clark. She needs to pick up this win. She's got two wins by knockout, three wins by uh, submission, and two wins by decision. And Alexa Grasso, we're all familiar with. She's undefeated, guys. This is a big fight for Alexa here. I'm excited to see it. Heather Joe Clark is uh, is quite the test for a debut fighter like Alexa Grasso here. Straight out of Mexico. Young fighter. She's 23 and has amazing striking. Keep your eye on this girl tomorrow night. This fight can go either way. This is one of the throw-up fights. The girls always put on an amazing event. But, uh, you know, Heather Joe Clark, her striking 
is uh, you know, overwhelming sometimes. She couldn't really put it together against Carolina, but watch out for her. She's coming off a loss, and when you're fighting a fighter coming off a loss, man, it's it's going to put you to the text. So the debut fight for Alexa Grasso here could go either way undefeated with a welcome to the UFC with her first loss. That would be tough. If she gets the win, I'm excited to see what's next for her. I'm leaning with Alexa Grasso here, though. Heather Joe Clark might be strong in that first round. Alexa, she's brute. She's uh, only an inch shorter, too. So it's not like there's much of a, an advantage on Heather Joe Clark's side, either. So I'm leaning for Alexa Grasso, but do not mark my words, guys, because this fight can go either way. And then, guys, we got Benil Darius ranked ninth with a 13-2 and record going against Rashid Magomedov, ranked 15. And this is going to be another exciting fight. 19-1, and Rashid Magomedov. Very exciting fighter. High output once again. And this is a free card guide. And like Minion said, they're taking a lot of the fighters that were on that card that just got canceled in Manila and throwing them on this card, which is stacking it up and which is a treat for all of us. I can tell you that. But with eight wins by knockout, one win by submission, and 10 decision wins, Rashid Magomedov usually pushed in towards uh, the later rounds. Doesn't come out too sharp, too, uh, too strong in that very first round. But James Vick just suffered a loss to Benil Darius. And we all saw what happened there. Three wins by knockout, six wins by submission, four wins by decision. Benil Darius always puts on an exciting show. Very intelligent fighter. And his speed is on point. Um, grappling so-so. He has the loss over uh, Michael Sasse back in April, I think that was. But he has wins over uh, Michael Johnson. Wins over Jim Miller. I mean, come on. He's been put to the test time after time again. Is Rashid uh, Magomedov a test for Benil Darius here? I don't know, but if Rashid can win this, he's going to jump right up those rankings. But I'm leaning towards Benil to win this by a submission probably later in the fight. Probably uh, probably in the third round. That's where I'm going here. There's a one-inch height advantage for Benil Darius, but that's not going to do much for him. The takedown average for Benil Darius is much higher than Rashid. Benil most likely going to win this by submission. That's who I'm going with tonight. And then we got Ricardo Lamas versus Charles Oliveira. Oliveira just got submitted off of his, uh, while he was on top position against Showtime Pettis. He's still ranked, though, at 8th. He didn't really drop too much there. With a 21-6 and six record, he's going to be fighting Ricardo Lamas, ranked 4th right now. The bully, who's ranked 16-5. and five. Ricardo Lamas, you know, coming off a loss, though. His last fight was against Max Holloway, who's now on a 9-fight win streak, waiting for that featherweight belt to come loose. But Ricardo Lamas also has a win over Diego Sanchez, who's fighting the co-main event of this night. His, uh, in his last three fights, though, he's only one for three. So he's not, uh, not doing too hot lately, but he's still up top. And a win right here will definitely seal it. And especially if it's against Charles Oliveira, who's a submission artist. Oh, this is a tough one. It can go either way. Both these guys really need this win. They're both at the top of the division either way. Top 10 guys. The free fight. I'm excited for it. It could go either way, though. Charles Oliveira, man, he needs to pick up this win or he's going to be dropping a lot. But you know what? He's going to be his number four fighter, so he's not really going to be dropping a lot, but he definitely needs to pick up this win because he doesn't need a two-fight loss behind him. Four wins by knockout, four wins by submission, seven wins by decision. You know what? Ricardo Lamas, I just don't know. He's been hot and cold lately. Charles Oliveira's been on a, one hell of a, a streak. I mean, his last, his last fight against Pettis, he just couldn't do anything. Pettis was going in there fresh in the featherweight debut. Landed nasty kicks on him. But Charles Oliveira was a warrior. Just kept pushing forward. And we can expect that tonight. He's got heart. And that gets us into our co-main event. Diego Sanchez, who's coming off a loss to uh, Joe Lozon knockout. And I, I heard uh, on Fighter and the Kid, they were talking. Uh, Brennan Schaub was saying that Diego Sanchez never been knocked out. I was, I was freaking out yelling at my TV. Because I was like, Big Brown, you're, what, what are you talking about, dude? Do you not remember UFC 200? He just got knocked out by uh, by Joe Lozon. And then he just won against Jim Miller. Which is kind of funny. Because uh, Diego Sanchez beat Jim Miller. And then he gets knocked out by Joe Lozon. Joe Lozon beats Diego Sanchez. But then loses to Jim Miller. However, he's going against Marcin Hello tomorrow night or tonight. Who has a 22-4 and four record. He's from Bellator. You guys might recognize his name there. Great submission and leg locks. That's what I could say about him. He's a young fighter. Four wins by knockout. Six wins by decision. This is his debut fight. And for a debut fight to be going up against uh, somebody who's been since season one of Ultimate Fighter, Diego, the Nightmare Sanchez. 
who's he he was now calling himself the dream we all know him as the nightmare and then that fight against uh Joe Lozon man I was just totally surprised to see him get knocked out like that. So he's, we know what he's going to be bringing to the table tonight. Marcin Hells has his hand filled for his debut. If he can beat Diego Sanchez, he's going to get a warm welcome into the UFC. We're going to have to see what happens, but I'm leaning towards Diego. If he can escape the submission skills of Marcin Held, Marcin's going to have uh, one hell of a night dealing with a nightmare. He's got his hands full for sure. And that gets us into our main event, guys. And this could easily be a title fight. RDA has been champion. Uh, right before this fight, before losing to Eddie Alvarez, Tony Ferguson, been wanting this fight for a while now, calling out the man's name personally, RDA. I want that fight. And like Minion said in his interview, if RDA wins, what does it mean for him? And if Tony wins, what does this mean for him? Well, when you're ranked third and you're ranked second and you're former champion, especially for RDA, um, you know, Conor McGregor versus Eddie Alvarez, you'd think you get the winner of that, but I just don't think Conor's going to hang around. I think he needs to go back down, defend his belt. We all know that needs to happen. Jose deserves the fight. There, there's no more saying no to that. It's been enough time has passed now. Jose Aldo definitely deserves it at this point. We got our show, show money from Conor McGregor to put on a couple shows against Nate Diaz, and now we're going to be seeing him at UFC 205 in New York City against Eddie Alvarez. He has the chance to become a two-division champion. Now, of course, if he wins that belt, he has to defend it. So the winner of this fight could definitely fight Conor McGregor. Maybe not next immediately, but soon. And we all wanted Tony Ferguson to fight Khabib or Magnemadoff. Forget about that at this point. This is it right here. If Tony Ferguson wins tonight against RDA, it still is a shot. He is next in line, in my opinion. With a 22-3 record, the real El Kukui has been on fire. Like Minya said, eight-fight win streak. Eight fight win streak. His last fight, Orlando Venata, put on a great show. That was his UFC debut. Before that, he beat Edson Barboza. That fight is free and up on UFC, uh, on YouTube actually. Free fight, Edson Barboza versus Tony Ferguson. Wild fight. The speed of Tony Ferguson and the heart, the wrestling, the boxing, the ground and pound, the conditioning. He's always putting on a show every time he steps in there. So tonight, I really expect a, a real banger. And RDA really needs to win because. Coming off a loss to Eddie Alvarez with a knockout like that, I mean, wow. It wasn't a close fight at all. Before that, RDA beat Donald Cowboy. He beat Showtime Pettis stealing his belt. He beat Nate Diaz. He beat Benson Henderson, Jason High. I mean, the list goes on and on. His last loss was against uh, Habib. His last loss was against Habib Nurmagomedov, who is still in the mix. So another guy who's going to be next at uh, a title shot if he wins his next fight. But RDA, man, with five wins by knockout, eight wins by submission, 13 by decision. His jiu-jitsu game is on point. He's got underrated power. He goes in there, and he'll throw down with you. It was a big mistake against Eddie Alvarez. But Tony Ferguson, man, he'll stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with you. And if the fight goes to the ground, it's going to be interesting. Just like we saw tonight, Liam McGeary and Mr. Wonderful Phil Davis. I'm interested to see what's going to happen on the ground there. RDA, very experienced. Tony Ferguson, very experienced. Tony Ferguson's got a chin on him. RDA at the same time, a lot of people out there say that he's not the same since USADA stepped in. He's not, I mean, I haven't seen the before and after pictures, but, you know, I'll agree with that. His uh, last fight against Eddie Alvarez, it just uh, wasn't on point. But then again, that fight against Cowboy, I mean, he knocked him out. So, it goes back and forth in my mind. So, if the fight goes to the ground, it's going to be interesting. Tony Ferguson has one hell of a chin on him. However, another fight that's going to go five rounds, it's hard to see it going that long. I got Tony Ferguson to win this, and I will be surprised if uh, it ends in the first round. I see this ending later on in the fight. RDA versus Tony Ferguson, most likely going to go in there, fill each other out. It's an important fight. They don't want to look like an idiot, not take the chances. Tony Ferguson starts off a little slow, but will warm up. RDA really needs this win. What's going to happen? I don't know. Let me know what you guys think on Twitter at Pure Evil MMA. And I will let you know the full card breakdown and all of my predictions up on UFC pick a map. You can follow me at Evil Eddie and see what all of my picks are for this fight. And you can play along too. All you got to use is hashtag Pure Evil MMA. And let me know that you want to join our UFC pick em Because this week, and it's felt like so long since our last event. It's crazy and I'm so excited. Tomorrow we got a great group that plays along with us making their predictions that listen along with the podcast. And if I got any new listeners out there. That want to have fun tomorrow night. I'm going to be live tweeting. And everyone that listens to Pure Evil MMA and watches Pure Evil MMA is going to be tweeting right along. We're going to be all on UFC. Pick a map. 
So message me on Twitter and let me know that you want to play along and you can have your name announced live on the podcast next week for the winner of UFC Mexico. All right, guys. So as we get to the end of our show, I want to thank all of our guests that came on tonight. Tough alumni, hater, the whole cast in. I want to thank Valor Fight 38, Sawyer Ritz for coming on. Good luck in your future fights, guys. I cannot wait. December 2nd at UFC Fight Pass. Chat to Showtime Pettis. I hope that he uh, has good car insurance. Uh, Luke Rockhold out of his fight with Jacare Souza. Mark Hunt. I forgot to mention this. Mark Hunt had his first pro win October 31st. So this week in MMA. Make sure you guys give us a follow on Twitter at Pure Evil MMA. I want to give a huge shout out to all of our new listeners. Subscribe below. Let me know what you guys want to see on the next podcast. And I will make sure to get our next interview down pat. Subscribe below. Five stars. I had a great night with everybody. Make sure you follow us on YouTube. Pure Evil MMA with our interview with Diego Lima. I cannot wait for tonight. Let me know what you guys think. Is it RDA or Tony Ferguson? I'm Evil Eddie. You're listening to episode number 23 of Pure Evil MMA. Behave yourselves, fellas. And let's do it. It's fight night.